Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, this session of the Global Strategy Forum here at the National Liberal Club uh, in central London. My name is Michael Clark. I'm uh, bookending this session. I'm not chairing it, but I'm st I'll, I'll open it and I'll close it because today we have a unique event, which is a father and son conversation <clears throat> between Sam Friedman and Sir Lawrence Friedman about uh, Lawrence Friedman's latest book, Command. I'll say a bit more about that uh, in a minute, but just let me uh, mention a couple of other points before we get going. The next meeting of the Global Strategy Forum, like this, be a hybrid meeting with people in the room and people online, will be on the 7th of December, when uh, Lord Darrick, Kim Darrick, will be speaking with Sir Malcolm Rifkind, uh, reflecting upon the midterm elections in the United States, talking about British-American relations. So that will be at this time on the 7th of December which in addition to being Pearl Harbor Day, I seem to remember is somebody's birthday. Um, so 7th of December, uh, as you were here. Um, you can follow us, uh, this meeting on YouTube and you can get details about that on the uh, Global Strategy Forum website. And you can follow it on Twitter, which is hashtag GSF Events Day, all one word, hashtag GSF Events Day. And I should say that the question and answer function, for those of you who are watching online, <clears throat> will be open at the end of the uh, presentation. So if you want to ask a question, I'll be taking questions from the audience here uh, at the National Liberal Club. But if you want to ask a question, do ask it on the Q&A function uh, on your system and it will come up on a screen and we'll try to integrate any online questions with questions as we're live from the audience. So um, I'm very pleased to be able to bookend uh, this conversation. Uh, conversations between Sam Friedman and his father, Lawrence Friedman, are fairly frequent these days. Um, if you go to Comment is Freed, which is a very uh, successful tag on the Substack uh, system, you'll see that they're in, involved in conversation a great deal. You know, it's interesting that, <clears throat> you know, fathers and sons do have conversations. I mean, generally speaking, there comes a moment when every father sits down with his son and has a serious conversation about his behaviour. <laughs> And eventually, there comes another moment where every son sits down with his father and has a serious conversation about his behaviour. I'm not sure if they've reached that stage yet, but they've been having interesting conversations about all matters strategic. So I'm very pleased to introduce, first of all, Sam Friedman. I have known Sam on and off since he was a, a very young boy. He is a, a senior fellow now at the Institute for Government. He was CEO of the uh, Education Partnership Group, and he was also a senior policy advisor in the Department of Education, working for Michael Gove. And people who may have followed the comment is freed tag will know that um, Sam Friedman is a prolific writer and commentator on British politics, many aspects of British politics, and some aspects of international politics. And his views are both acerbic and funny, extremely well argued and extremely well bucked up. And he's going to interview his father, Lawrence Friedman. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Laurie. He's been a, a mentor and friend to me for many years. And I won't try and go through even the headlines of his CV since we'll be here till two o'clock. Um, <clears throat> I would merely say that I've always thought that Laurie, and I've said this about him before, he's like the sort of Ian Botham of the academic world. When Ian Botham was in his pomp, he was known as a beer tent emptier. Because when Ian Botham strode out to bat, the beer tent was empty. Everybody would come to see him bat. And Laurie is like that Ian Botham character. When Laurie comes to give a lecture, when he strides out to the wicket, the common room empties. He's a common room emptier. It isn't just the students who uh, come to his lectures, but his colleagues leave their common rooms and they come and hear what he has to say. He is quite simply uh, the leading and best commentator on strategic matters in the United Kingdom at the moment. And he is a worthy successor to the much-missed Sir Michael Howard. He is very much... Uh, in the mould of Sir Michael Howard, at least in his eminence, and it's always a, a pleasure to listen to him. So, I will sit back and I will enjoy a conversation between Sam and Lawrence Friedman. Sam, over to you. Thanks very much. This, <coughs> this feels like a very advanced version of a bring your child to work day, but um, <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <coughs> nevertheless, uh, we will, we will, we will, um, uh, I wanted to start by asking, um, about, obviously about the book. When I first read it, which was summer last year, um, had a different title. It only went up to Afghanistan. Um, and uh, then, obviously, we had the, the, the invasion of Ukraine uh, earlier this year. You've incorporated some material about that in the book. Did it change the way you thought about any of the arguments of the wider book, how you've, how you've thought about command as, a, as an idea in general? Not, I mean, the book was pretty complete by the time the war 
uh, started, there was a chapter on Ukraine. There is a chapter in Ukraine that was already there. Um, and it's sort of not hard to see the join. Um, but Penguin were very good and, and understood it'd be ridiculous uh, not to include material uh, on what was going on. So the, the story's up to date to about June. What happened, I think, is it fitted in with arguments that were already under development. So one of the arguments under development was something that had already struck me, was the problems that autocracies have in making bad decisions. Which is not to say straight away that democracies don't have any problems with bad decisions. Obviously, they do. Um, but there's a very special sort of bad decision that, a, that an autocracy can take, which is a, a consequence of secrecy, um, a personalised dictator who believes that um, uh, they can get away with it and, and there's nobody there to criticise because they tend to be surrounded by sycophants. So I was already thinking of that. There's a number of examples in the book from, um, uh, say, Yahya Khan in, in Pakistan in 1971 or Saddam Hussein with the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, there's plenty of e examples of that already in the book. So that was one thing that was already there. The other thing, which is relevant to the chapter on Ukraine, was that was about the origins uh, of the current conflict, which is in 2013-14, but about the role of militias, uh, which is what interested me, that, that you had all these groups um, that had been given a licence uh, to operate by the Russians, but had a sort of independent existence all of their own, often not too far away from criminality, uh, led by Russians, by and large. Um, and what had interested me about that period was that though Putin had clearly been a risk taker, a gambler, his gam gambles them pretty calculated. That, that, that's what you got from this period. He knew he could take Crimea or went for Crimea when he was confident, but actually had not taken the Donbass. He'd only really moved into the Donbass when it looked like the separatists, as we then called them, um, would lose it. Um, so it, it interested, So what interested me when the war started was the contrast between the, the calculating uh, gamble of, of 2014 and, and maybe it was calculating, but it was a very poor calculation in 2022. So that, uh, in that sense, it, it moved the argument along. Um, I think I'll stop there. And so the, the, I think there's a point about the difference between authoritarian regimes, sort of autocracies, and, um, and, and, and democratic regimes comes out very strongly, I, I thought, in, in, in the book. Um, what are the what are the sort of strengths and, and weaknesses for, for on the democratic side? So autocracies have this sort of brittleness and this sort of this sort of fear at the top. What's the sort of counterpoint for democracies? I think the problems for democracies is they're not as good as they maybe should be. I'm quite, I had to put this carefully. At being cynical, um, so the if you're um, if you're intervening when, when the, UK, US intervened. They had to intervene in a way that would make things better, not just to stop things going bad. Um, and this created unrealistic expectations about uh, what would follow Saddam or what would follow the Taliban, made it difficult certainly to do deals with the Taliban when it might have made sense to do deals with the Taliban and so on. Um, so it's, and it's a common argument now that, that, that we're seeing over Ukraine. Um, where I tend, in this case, to take a slightly different view. But there's a, the realist argument is, um, look, there's only so far Ukraine can go. Um, at some point, wars end with negotiation. So you know, don't push this constantly as, a, as, a, as the virtuous democracy versus the, the evil dictatorship thing. At some point, a deal will have to be done. I think the problem with this, A, this is actually as clear <laughs> <laughs> a distinction between good and evil in these things as you're likely to get. But also Putin's got no interest in negotiation for a variety of reasons. So you haven't, so it's not as if that option is, is so easily there. Um, so I think, the, the, so one of the, one of the issues that, that, that we're debating, thinking about, is the problems with democracies and expecting people 
to go to war for undemocratic outcomes. Um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a very obvious problem. I mean, it, you, can, you can understand it. And I think it's all that's also part of the issue, whereas in autocracies, the, the problem is always going to be that uh, a, a small group of people can take a very big decision. Um, yeah, we just go back from before the uh, war with Iraq. I mean, Tony Blair was doing the rounds all the time, trying to argue for the decision and so on. So trying to, you've got to make a case that works for uh, public opinion. And maybe, you know, the, the best lesson to draw from that and others is we actually aren't very good at going to war unless we're very sure of the case that we've got. Maybe that was just the problem. So um, the use of military power just to reshape international order I don't think we do, we do very well, therefore possibly best not to try. And the other thing about, about sort of democracies that, that I think comes through really clearly, and especially in more recent sort of campaigns and, uh, that, have, that, have, that the US and the UK have been involved in, is, is the way that generals have to start behaving and thinking like political actors within a democratic system. They're, they're, they also they have to think about how the, what their actions yeah. and statements, how they appeal to... To, to voters. I mean, you see it every spending review we have in, in this country where I'm just waiting for the, the, you know, this round of spending cuts for the Daily Telegraph front page with generals say army will cease to exist if, you know, if, if, if cuts go ahead. Um, but but uh, what's interesting is how you know, people like Stanley McChrystal, David Petraeus, Wesley Clark have, have become sort of political actors in themselves within the context of these campaigns. Well, I think there's two things going on. One is the whole question of civil military relations, which is the core of the book in, in some ways. Uh, and the issue there is, uh, I mean, it's just sort of it's a challenge. The book is a challenge to the idea of a division of labor between the civilians who come up with the political objectives and the military who have to work out how to achieve them because the military advice ha uh, is needed to work out whether political objectives are feasible and the politicians have a natural interest in, in what the generals are up to, especially if that's going to leave um, a lot of people dead and, uh, and they're having to explain why things have gone wrong and so on. So it, it's an argument for, for, for close interaction and that requires politically aware generals, uh, which we tend to get. Um, you're, uh, there's something else going on in the States, which we don't have quite as much in this country uh, but you see, you know, you see it in the elections that are going on in Israel today as well, it, it is when generals become political figures um, precisely because of their generalship uh, and it becomes a route into political office. Um, now, you know, in most dictatorships, they work very hard to avoid that sort of thing happening. Uh, so one of the features of autocracies is, is that they tend to coup-proof their militaries, that people are put into uh, key positions because of their loyalty rather than their professional competence, which is fine until you go to war and you discover that, that they're pretty inept in, in, in the basics of generalship. Um, so we don't do that because we assume that there is a, 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 an understanding on the military side that they can go so far but no further. And again, there are obvious cases um, the French in the, in the 1950s over Algeria, when they looked like they might step over that, um, uh, worries about a worries about a coup. Uh, some of you may remember the movie Seven Days in May uh, about something happening in the States, which was a film that Kennedy actively encouraged to be made because of experiences during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we have those issues, but by and large, the general step back. But it does mean that when they're out of office, they have become figures that uh, uh, may have some uh, political clout as a result. Um, it, it, it happens in the States to a degree. Um, uh, Wes Clark ran for, ran for president, MacArthur, um, was thinking of it, but lost the Republican nomination to Eisenhower, uh, another general. Um, but it doesn't quite happen here to the same extent. Um, out of all of the examples that you cover in the book, who do you think were the generals, particularly sort of the, on the US-UK side, who were most successful at managing their political masters? 
well, it's easy on the UK side because it's Terry Lewin, who was um, the uh, chief of defence staff during um, <coughs> during the Falklands. Um, he, um, Margaret Thatcher, um, for all the you know, being photographed in a tank and Iron Lady and so on, had very little knowledge or or, or even that much interest in, in military affairs. Um, and there's a, there's a famous moment during the, uh, that, that, that meeting in the, in the Commons when they received the news that a, an invasion was imminent and Henry Leach, who obviously made one of the most important military interventions in British political history, went along and told, said, you do have an option to send a task force. And, and when he said, you know, when it's there in, in two weeks, she said, you mean two days? Uh, and she said, no, two weeks. Uh, and I think, I mean, Lewin took over from Leach, but, but it, it was a constant explanation of the risks and the dangers and got her confidence, uh, without which it could have been a different, um, a different answer. Um, so I, I think on the British side, I don't have any problem in, in, in working it out. On the American side, it's tricky because it's a while since the Americans had a clear-cut uh, victory, if you like. Um, it's not that they lose their wars, they don't quite win them. Um, uh, Petraeus is the obvious example, um, but Petraeus uh, took advantage of a situation. He prepared for it. He, 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 he took counterinsurgency um, uh, seriously. Uh, had got the Marines worked up uh, as well as the army uh, to, to, to look into it. And so when the moment came when Bush, it wasn't Petraeus who decided on the surge, he was there uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, you look at the briefing he gave in September 2007 to Congress, which is a critical moment uh, where you see the sort of democratic opposition to the surge just fade away as he talks. So again, as somebody who knew how to play the politics, um, he was very effective. And if he hadn't played at other things, he might have uh, been even more effective uh, uh, as, a, as a political figure. But, but the, the scandal that, that eventually ended his career at the CIA uh, probably put pay to his polit political ambitions as well. I mean, one of the one of the one of the issues, I guess, with 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 war and democracy, as you say, you say, is that it's very hard to sustain public support over a, over a very long period of time. Which is one reason why America get into this position where they never quite manage to win a war because they they, they take so long. Um, we, we saw that very clearly in Afghanistan uh, last year. Uh, do you think? that could have been handled any differently, given the point where sort of Biden inherited it? Do you think that could have been managed either by the generals or by the political leaders in a different way to produce a better outcome? Or was it by sort of inevitable I think that, at that point? I mean, I mean, it had been decided by Trump, in effect. People forget this. Uh, I mean, Trump had done the deal with the Taliban, which he celebrated, as Trump celebrates all his deals. Um, and uh, he, he bequeathed a situation. That being said, Biden was determined to get out. He felt um, that Obama had been bounced into the Afghan surge uh, in 2009 and um, he wasn't going to make the same mistake. I think, th so there's two aspects of the question. One, um, was it inevitable that the US and allies would leave Afghanistan at some point? with the Taliban in not a bad position to take over? Probably. I mean, I, I think it was going to be very hard to sustain it, and not on a few thousand troops. You'd have had to have increased the number of troops, uh, and Biden was unwilling to do that. Could it have been handled better in terms of realising that when the Afghan army collapsed, it was likely to collapse quite quickly? Um, yeah, I mean, they were far too optimistic about... Uh, uh, about how you could expect an army uh, that was not as committed as the Taliban to sustain itself when its main prop w was leaving and, and, and with it the air power. So uh, that bit could have, I think, been handled better. Uh, but that, it, by this time, the US was going to leave Afghanistan uh, and, and allies with it, I don't think should have come as a surprise. And it could have happened earlier. I mean, the, the, the tragedy in some ways, well, 
think of the what ifs of history, is that if modern drone technology had existed in 2001, um, the idea that you had to go in to Afghanistan and overthrow the Taliban to get bin Laden wouldn't have been seen as so pressing. Um, uh, uh, and you know, the urgency that George uh, W. Bush brought to that, um, you, you know, go, go I and mean, they didn't even, one of the chapters in the book is how they didn't even get bin Laden mm. at that point, he managed to escape. Whereas, you know, one suspects that these days it wouldn't have been so difficult uh, to mount an operation to get him, but that didn't happen. Um, there were opportunities to negotiate with the Taliban then, um, but the Taliban themselves were divided and, and the Taliban didn't, uh, didn't respond to the possibilities that were there. So you end up with the situation, but we always should have recognised that the Taliban were, in, were going to be a big part of the, the Afghan political, uh, political scene. We've talked quite a lot about the US um, uh, and UK, but I think one of the most interesting things for me about the book was finding out about some more obscure parts of, of, of history that I didn't know about, what, what happened in East Pakistan, Che Guevara's exploits in, in, in the Congo, um, and, and so on. How did you go about the selection process for choosing which, which, which ca campaigns you, 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 you focused on? It wasn't very um, uh, scientific. It was a number of... One, I was curious about it myself, uh, which is always a good basis to start research. Secondly... Um, I thought I could get material. Um, this was a lockdown book, um, and a lot of the stuff wouldn't have been easy to get in archives anyway. Uh, so just to take the Che Guevara example, which was the Congo in 1965, um, he, he, he kept diaries. Um, so uh, you can follow what he was doing. There's a sort of primary source there. Um, with, with East Pakistan, there was, um, now Bangladesh, uh, there was a commission in Pakistan as to why there was a surrender in the East, um, and they published all the cables going back and forth. But, so I think it was always, to me, important with this book to be able to cite, um, get over the words, the language in which these things were being discussed, the ten because part of the interest to me was the tensions that arise between senior commanders um, and um, with each other, with the politicians and so on. I mean, that, what, it's the human side of it that I think makes it interesting. Um, so those things were part of the case selection. I didn't want it just to be US-UK, um, although inevitably they were going to be a big part of it. Um, and I, so I wanted variety... Um, the French case sort of just suggested itself because um, it, it, it's a point where generals did get ahead of themselves and, uh, and, and interfere directly in French politics. Um, uh, Israel it was Sharon because Sharon is, is a fascinating general in himself and is a very good example of how if somebody who is naturally insubordinate, I mean, the most insubordinate general you could ever find, um, uh, so long as there was somebody above him, uh, sort of A, protecting him when he needed protection, but B, putting him in his place when he had to be put in his place, he was a brilliant general. As soon as he was in charge, it was catastrophic um, with, with Lebanon in 82. So I, I, I sort of tried to pick pick around to get a variety of different types of conflict which, and therefore different types of generals. Which, which one surprised you the most in terms of one you hadn't sort of done much work on before and sort of changed your mind the most? Well, I knew nothing about the Congo one until I went in. What interested me about the Congo, which I, I didn't even know when I started looking into, because I've always been since an undergraduate and when we had these pictures of that very photogenic revolutionary, I was always sort of been intrigued by Guevara because I always thought it's a very good example of some uh, of a sort of PR campaign to hide an actually terrible strategist. Uh, so I, I was quite interested in him. But what I hadn't realised was that the person who was he was supposed to be dealing with at the time in the Congo, the, the local warlord who was 25 at the time, was Laurent Kabila, who eventually, 30 years later, 
uh, led a revolution, um, basically uh, as a puppet of the Rwandans, uh, to overthrow Mobutu in, in the Congo. So, um, uh, and I had no idea, I mean, I, I should have known, but I didn't. So it was absolutely quite fascinating to be able to pick up on this character and then pick it up later, 30 years later, because Mobutu, uh, and then actually Kabila himself, are perfect examples of autocratic leaders um, who don't trust anybody else, who have to ha don't want to have any generals around them who are capable of, uh, take, uh, of overthrowing them or anything. Uh, and take terrible decisions. Um, so it, it, it suited all sorts of purposes. But I, you know, until, until I started, I, I, knew, I knew about Guevara, but I didn't know anything about Kabila. So that, that was interesting. Um, and the French one, I mean, I knew, I did know about it, but it, it's still an extraordinary story, the whole Algerian story. And it was sort of relevant to the counterinsurgency thing in the... Um, on, on the US side, because uh, it's had an extraordinary influence. The whole uh, mythology about the, the French paras in Algeria and in Indochina created a sort of imagery that, you know, forgetting all the terrible things sometimes they did, um, that influenced people like Petraeus and McChrystal and so on, who, who, who sort of made the writings of, uh, of the French counterinsurgency campaign required reading for their own people without you know, really looking at the political context in which that was taking place. I, I know we want to come to some questions from other people in a bit. There's one other, one last sort of theme of the book I wanted to, to, to ask about, which is technology, which I think comes through quite clearly the way technology has changed. Um, the, the interactions between the sort of political and the, and the, and the sort of on the ground commanders. Um, it's a comment very early on in the Ukraine war that really struck me was that me sort of sitting on Twitter would have more information about what was going on on the ground than Truman or Eisenhower would have had about a uh, career or somewhere, something like that. Mm. Um, how, how do you think that, that sort of, over the period you were looking at, that's affected uh, the nature of these campaigns? Actually, one of my favorite quotes I use in the book is somebody American complaining about the war in um, Syria against ISIS, or Iraq, and, uh, that, that it was easier to get somebody to drop, a, to get permission to drop a bomb than to get permission to post something on Twitter <laughs> um, uh, because of the political consequences. I think the big, there's two big changes, over, three big changes over the period. Uh, the first is the nuclear dimension, which is obviously still with us. Uh, worrying about over Ukraine. Secondly, the digital revolution that produces um, precision weapons, that side of the digital revolution. Um, so the, go back to the point I was making about what could have happened in 2001. Um, and then third, social media and communication, well, just communications. So going back to the Falklands, uh, for a large chunk of the time, the land commander, Jeremy Moore, was on the QE2 and communications had broken down. There weren't secure communications on the QE2. So poor Julian Thompson was stuck at, um, at San Carlos being nagged by John Field Fieldhouse back in London and, and, and uh, Jeremy Moore, who should have been the key person um, managing that, w w was almost incommunicado and very frustrated. And why was Jeremy more on the QE2, um, he had an option to go to Ascension and do a paradrop to, uh, to join Julian Thompson. He, he just worried about the headlines that would create um, about, uh, about the, 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 the senior commander parachuting in um, and wanted to keep a low-key profile for himself. And he thought he'd be able to stay in touch, but of course he couldn't. So I think you compare that now when everybody's in touch with each other constantly until the moment there isn't, they aren't, We're, because you're so dependent now on the networks. So, you know, these the stories now from the first day of the war in Ukraine, where, um, you know, whatever else one thinks takes us back to Twitter. Elon Musk, Starlinks kept the Ukrainians communicating would turn out to be absolutely critical because it would have been a much harder fight without that. And the Russians lost a lot of their secure communications, which meant that their operational security was lousy. 
So, you know, th these sort of things, I think, is, is a major transformation since, um, you know, the, the, the early stages of the war. I mean, you know, I, I don't start with um, the Second World War, but Korea's not that difficult, um, not that different, when, you know, senior commanders would take a long time before they uh, had any idea of what had happened in the battle. And then you'd have to pace backwards and forwards, wondering what was going on. Whereas you know, now they, they'll know almost immediately. Indeed, can, can join in the decision making. Do you want to go back? To yeah, the, to Sam, Laurie, thank you very much. <clears throat> very interesting um, conversation. We'll, we'll throw it open now to um, question and answers from the floor and from our um, online audience, if you have questions. Um, here um, in the room, we'll, you'll need a microphone, partly for the purposes of the recording. So please wait for that microphone to arrive um, if you're asking a question. Let me throw it open now immediately. Sir, let me just make, make it difficult for Jacqueline first. I'll, I'll just put it at the very front, who will now receive the microphone. If you'd identify yourself, sir, that would help. Uh, Ali Bahaji of North South Publications. Uh, a Brussels publication called the, the EU Observer revealed in a, a secret report that the European Union has actually sent a message to Putin and they wanted to uh, sit down with him around uh, a table to hammer out uh, a resolution to the Ukraine problem. Yet the Americans are not actually warming up to it. Uh, is that something that sort of divides EU and the American policy? And also, are we heading for a new world order, bearing in mind that Russia, China, and even India are on one side and the rest on the other. Thank you. Um, I mean, I've no idea. I'd be surprised if that was true, but it's, it's not impossible. The, the problem they've got with all these uh, proposals that uh, Ukraine must negotiate with Russia is Russia has got no interest in negotiating. Um, and the reason for that, it, I'm, just, just, I'm actually trying to write about it at the moment, to sort out in my own head, is that um, I don't, it's not in Putin's interest to, to end this war without something to show for it. Um, and uh, he hasn't got enough to show for it now. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't stop at the moment, the Ukrainians wouldn't stop fighting. Uh, so there's sort of an idea that there's a, there's a, a negotiated compromise to be found. It's actually very hard to identify it um, because Putin now wants four provinces, which are part which is now claimed for Russia, um, uh, none of which he now actually holds 100%. Um, and Ukraine is not going to give it to him. And I think there's a problem for Putin is a sort of reckoning that comes when the war is over. While there's sort of this war going on, um, which he can sustain, I think, at home, we'll see what happens in the battlefield, um, that's easier than having to explain why he embarked on this adventure when there's not a lot to show for it. So the difficulty with let's have negotiations and sit around a table and hammer out a deal is it isn't an obvious deal to be had, and that's been the problem for a long time. Um, I mean, one, one could work out possibilities, but not that would interest both parties. And I just think there's a limit to the betrayal that um, we, you know, the, the Americans or the Europeans would do of, uh, of Ukraine. It, you know, this is, the way this war has been conducted is so extreme on the Russian side, it really does make it difficult to, to see why anybody would trust a deal, never mind work out what it looks like. The New World Order is, is obviously quite an important um, issue for Putin. I mean, Putin presents the war now as being with NATO. Um, and if you looked at his Valde speech, his most recent one, uh, the whole pitch is about a multipolar world and taking away from American hegemony. And that obviously hasn't appealed to China and India. But his problem is he, he, he's a diminishing pole. Um, and I think that's how the Chinese and the Indians are now starting to look at it. Um, I mean, you know, it's very noticeable in Xi's speech to the 20th Party Congress, there wasn't even a mention of Ukraine. 
Um, I think he finds the whole thing an embarrassment, um, myself. So um, if Putin had been successful, um, or you know, if he'd better still for him, if he hadn't actually gone to war, but had used the pressure he'd put on Ukraine to get something out of the situation at the start of the year, then we'd be talking much more about the sort of multipolar world and following on from Afghanistan, the weakness of the Biden administration and so on. Actually, what's happened is, despite putting Europe through a lot of pain and trouble, it's unified the West, um, given Biden a leadership role, which he's taken moderately well. Um, and uh, while made Russia look a bit foolish, so, and, 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 and I mean, evil, I mean, in the sense of uh, the war crimes and attacks on civilian infrastructure and so on. So I think, um, and that, that's why it's just difficult to see what the negotiation looks like. That's why I get very gloomy about this war. Um, you know, it would be nice, in most of these conflicts, you can sort of work out what the eventual deal looks like. I find it very difficult in this case um, until the Russian military basically decides the game isn't worth the candle anymore. Mm. OK, I'm going to make life easier on our microphone by taking two questions at the front. First from John Wilson, then from General Sir Richard Barons, and then online from Craig Oliphant. But let's, uh, John Wilson first. <clears throat> and remember, you can ask questions of either of our guests today. <laughs> John Wilson, uh, how do you explain the Western democracies' failures in Vietnam, Afghanistan, <coughs> the loss of Crimea, and now an uncertain <coughs> future in the Ukraine. Is this the fault of our commanders? <laughs> Briefly, if you would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm gonna, oh, sorry, I thought I was waiting for a number of questions. OK, um, I think... Um, well, you, you can explain the failures in, Viet, in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and, and Iraq um, in the same way I would explain the Russian failure in, uh, in Ukraine, which it's unwise to in, uh, try to occupy a place where you're not welcome. Um, I, mean, I don't think it's more complicated in the end than that. Or you're very dependent upon the local balance of forces, and if you've misread the local balance of forces, um, and obviously, you know, in, in Ukraine, Putin had um, the separatists who've done a lot of the fighting. I mean, people you know, under, don't note just how many uh, of the dead on the Russian side are actually Ukrainians. Um, so, um, and, and Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, we're all putting ourselves in a position where we were either trying to suppress an insurgency or hold the ring in a developing civil war. And public opinion, understandably, got tired of it. Uh, so the problem is not being able to get quick, decisive victories. Um, now, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I spent seven years of my life on the Iraq inquiry, and, you know, I think the, the military failing in, 19, uh, in 2003 was, while they were perfectly well aware of the problems that could arise in, in, um, after you toppled Saddam, they played those problems down uh, and, and just assumed that the Americans would sort it out um, once, once Saddam had been toppled without really thinking through the politics of what we were getting into. And that, I think, it's a failure of the politicians who should also understand these things as well as, as, well as the military. I don't, think, I don't see Crimea as being our fault. Um, I think it was um, a moment of political upheaval and Putin decided he could take advantage. The fact is, if Putin had stopped at Crimea and not got involved in the Donbass, um, okay. then he could have probably got away with it. Um, but but uh, uh, there's an old Russian saying that the appetite grows with eating. Uh, and uh, uh, sadly, I mean, you know, tragically, that, that's what happened. Okay. General Sir Richard. Thank you. Richard Barnes, um, GSF Advisory Board member. You said at the start of your talk that democracies like to go to war to make things better. Mm. And you've described a little how 
the West has operated in Iraq and Afghanistan where the limits on the application of violence were quite well bounded. So no forcible movement of the population, no mass indiscriminate violence on the civil population. And you've described how that is different in the way Russia is prosecuting the campaign in Ukraine. Mm. So my question is, do you think democracies, both at the level of political and military leadership, are capable of being ruthless enough to protect themselves even when the issues are existential? Oh, I think they can do that. Um, you know, if you look back at Algeria, or us in, you know, in some of our own <coughs> colonial wars, we we're pretty ruthless. Um, uh, we tend to keep it quiet, but, but, but we could be ruthless. Um, it's just a question of you know, trying to imagine the circumstances now because um, you know, the, the, our two great wars were fought um, at a time when we had imperial possessions um, where, and this was what made them world wars. Uh, so uh, unless you're... You know, you're trying to take somebody else's territory or hold on to territory where you're not welcome. The ruthlessness doesn't so much uh, emerge. There's an issue which you can see with Ukraine at the moment. And, and I, and I, it's a conversation I've just had with somebody who's just come back from Ukraine. Um, the US clearly doesn't want Ukraine uh, to attack Russian targets. Uh, I mean, there's no secret here, uh, and it's affected the weaponry that the Ukrainians have been given. And I think for the Ukrainians, it's quite frustrating. On the other hand, there's no way they could fight a war against Russia the way that Russia has fought a war against them. They just couldn't do it. Russia's just too big. The targets are too far out of reach. And therefore, actually, what this has done has forced Ukraine into fighting for its own territory, to fight um, much more in line with the Geneva Conventions, if you like, the, the, uh, than Russia has fought. Um, and I think that's probably one reason why it's doing quite well in, in battle, uh, because it's had to concentrate. That's the only way where it can get an advantage over the Russians is in a proper battle. Um, because it, if it came into a, 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 a you know, trading blows against infrastructure, uh, there's no contest. Russia's clearly going to be able to, to win on that side every time. So the role of ruthlessness itself is, is quite interesting. I don't see any reason to suppose. We, ha we haven't seen any evidence, I don't think, um, that when the cause is considered existential, the democracies don't go to war. I mean, the, the Ukrainians have gone to war. I mean, they've, they've got a history of it, but, you know, uh, sort of particularly happy history of warfare on the Ukrainian side, but they've got, the, 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 they've risen to it. And you see, um, you know, young people with jobs in, in high tech and marketing and so on uh, becoming sort of battle-hardened battle veterans in a matter of months. So, yeah, I don't, I don't see... I don't think that's the, that that's the issue. And it's just a very diff, different set of settings in which we're likely to get into wars in the future. And obviously, you know, you've got that sort of nuclear thing hanging over, but, but um, which is in a way a separate but, conversation. But, but a sense behind Richard's question, Laurie, <clears throat> is also the idea, if I, if I may, that, that we've always been optimistic that the democracies ultimately win out because of the way we do things. Yeah. And we see off fascism and communism yeah. and autocracy. And there's a sort of worry that that may not be the future anymore. Well, it's a it worry. might be overmatched by the sheer ruthlessness and power of the autocracies who are on the. On well, the front so, foot. so part of my answer was that if you keep it to military to military, I don't. I mean, if I, if I was a China, uh, I'd be thinking, you know, I've just bought all this stuff from Russia. <laughs> yes. um, actually, the American stuff works better. Hmm. Um, uh, so I, I think. I think I, so our interest is in keeping it military to military. Mm. Um, uh, uh, now, you, the, there is an issue with China, which I think is of a different order to Russia. Um, I mean, Russia thought it was taking on, you know, a country, a country that was incapable of fighting back, and it, it's got disabused of that. I don't think anybody's got any illusions about what would happen uh, 
with China and Taiwan and so on, it's a much more dangerous and difficult game. Um, and uh, I would encourage everybody, to be, including the Chinese, to be very cautious about how that game is played. You'd have the same issue. I mean, you know, the porcupine strategy is, was, what, was what the Taiwanese called it, which is now what the Ukrainians call it as well, where you just make yourself extremely uncomfortable uh, to, to take over. Um, and it would be a difficult operation. But so uh, I don't think there's... Any, I mean, I don't think there's any reason to suppose that uh, our militaries couldn't eventually bring themselves to cope. We do have issues, um, and I think it's going to be an interesting question when and if this war gets over, um, with Russia having used up years of military production, um, the best part of its army, uh, a lot of its uh, its officer corps. Why do we think this is going to be a threat that justifies us? But you know, and I can give you answers to that, and no doubt the, the new integrated review will give us answers to that. But it, but I can see this becoming quite an interesting political question if if, if Russia falls away. Uh, but China is, is still going to be, uh, and of course we're not. You know, we're a, we're a minor player in that game. Yeah. OK, well, that leads on to the, quite neatly to the next, next question, which I'm taking online from Craig Oliphant. He says, thank you for your fascinating discussion. Look forward to reading the book. Good, yeah. I, I think you look forward to buying it, don't yeah. you? That's the point. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, so on Ukraine, given your analysis to date, where do you think uh, we're going to be in the war this time next year, if you'd like to consult your crystal ball? But you, you, you were alluding a little bit to that. And just on military te technology, how do you assess Ukrainian use and adaptation of Western systems provided? So would you like to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing? Uh, not really. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so on the, um, I mean, the Ukrainians have done pretty well yeah. on uh, adapting Western systems. Um, and, the, and the Western systems have done pretty well. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, high Mars was a game changer, mm. I think. Uh, be, uh, be, uh, and, but that was partly knowing what to target. Um, and I think they've understood um, the conflict they're in and, and where they had to make a difference, which was on going for logistic hubs and ammunition dumps and command posts. I think they, they understood that pretty well. And if they keep on like that, I think it, it still is, is the main Russian vulnerability. My, now, I've been very, I mean, I'm optimistic in a way on the Ukrainian side, and I have been almost from day one, because I couldn't see how the Russians can win. I think we've got the problem, the Russians can't win this. The issue is, can they lose it? Which is a different question. Um, and um, I think they can, but it's much harder. And my worry, is, I mean, this is where the mobilization comes in, uh, and goes back to my previous answer on, on my Putin doesn't seem to me to be that interested in negotiation. You see, he wants to stay in power. And I think staying in power it probably requires the war carrying on. Mm. So um, you've got winter coming up, and, and uh, you know, Richard and others are a better place than I am to, co to comment on the difference winter makes. Um, I think, from what I understand, that the Ukrainians are going to be better kitted out for the winter uh, than the Rus I mean, well, what you're seeing of the Russian conscripts is appalling. I mean, we've got to get ourselves, and the problem, you know, a different way of fighting. The numbers that the U Ukrainian high command, so you've got to take them with a pinch of salt, have been giving for Russians killed per day, per day over the last few days, is 950 mm. uh, killed one day, on Friday, yep. 650 the next day, 650 the day out of six. Now, these numbers always have to be taken with a pinch of salt. Even if you halve them. Yeah, that's still high. They're still incredibly high. Who's being killed? They're being killed mainly around Bakhmut, yep. which is um, the only offensive that's going on on the Russian side at the moment, as part of the little counter offensives that they've got going mm -hmm. in other places. Um, uh, this is the Wagner Group, which is being used as a political instrument because um, the, 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 to, to show that, there's, the, the, that this group can, can, can win wars while the rest of the Russian army is useless. Uh, and they're losing. Uh, 
I mean, they're, 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 after four months, they failed to take it. Who's being killed? People who are recruited from prisons. Yeah. Um, who are in the front line. Who are in the, in the front, they're being yeah. pushed into the front line. Um, they're, they're described as single attack soldiers. Um, they're disposable. And that's how a lot of the conscripts are being used. So from our point of view, to use those sorts of numbers w would be horrific. And the Ukrainians have lost a lot. I mean, we don't see the Ukrainian casualty numbers, but they're pretty high and, and, they're, and they're very upsetting. Um, but you know, you've got to sort of try and get into a mindset where it just assumes that these are disposable people. Mm. Um, and that makes, and so that's one reason why I'm a, I'm a bit cautious. Um, and I think one of the issues is, at what point do all these characters realise what's going on and start to try to do something about it? So it's the state of the Russian army is the biggest question mark mm. in all of this. But, but you've said, Laurie, uh, a couple of times I've heard you say, <clears throat> you don't believe that this sort of intensity of fighting can continue into that. next year. These things go in peaks and troughs, so they, they can't keep on at this intensity indefinitely. Is they can't, for both sides, they've got... I mean, the, the Ukrainians have got an ammunition problem, an artillery problem. Um, I mean, the, you know, the, they've got... They, they've captured from the Russians a lot of old equipment, but they don't really, in the end, have enough... Yeah. Uh, ammunition for it. Um, they can, it's easier to get Western ammunition, but they don't have enough of the Western systems. To, so they've got those sorts of problems. The Russians have got a real people problem, shortage problem. Uh, I don't think either side can keep at this intensity. So the issue, uh, the issue is whether you can imagine it bubbling over. My view still tends to be that over the next three to four months, even possibly quite quickly, and you follow it as closely as I do, Mike, um, the, the, in, in the uh, north, the Ukrainians will uh, make some progress quite quickly. Kherson's more, a bit more problematic. Bakhmut could be very interesting if the Russians, yeah. the Ukraine push back. If that sort of happens, we're in one situation. If somehow the Russians can hold their lines, then it, it, you could have, get into quite a difficult situation in, in, by February, March, when things thaw out, start to thaw out. Not, 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 not a clear answer, I'm afraid. So are we looking at sort of unstable ceasefires next year? A ceasefire which holds for a Truth. while and then breaks down? And sort of... I don't know. I mean, I, it, it, it's one possibility. My, my, my view is, uh, has been and, and remains that the best hope uh, is that the Russian military really can't cope with this anymore. I mean, you know, they're, they're said to have lost most of their clinic grad. <laughs> yes. Supports this. They're moving people out of Africa. They're moving people out of Syria. Uh, this is an army which claims to have a lot of roles and responsibilities. Uh, so my, my most benign scenario is a military-to-military -military deal mm. uh, on a disengagement of forces, which push, gets the Russians out of the bulk of Ukraine. Uh, and then at some point next year you, or later on, you can have a, a proper peace deal. The idea that there's a quick peace mm. that produces a quick... Um, a quick peace deal that produces a quick peace is, is you know, you just have to look at the issues yeah. of, of unravelling sanctions and, and it just takes forever. I mean, th this is not something that could be negotiated quickly. So you need a military disengagement before, you know, it's like nine, you know, November 18 before Versailles, but not yeah, yeah. hopefully not quite with Some the sort same. Of Minsk <laughs> 3 process. I mean, which yeah, but, no, but don't, don't, don't talk to the Ukrainians about Minsk 3. I know. You know they, <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it would, but that's what it might be. Sort of. Something that just drags forward yeah. and just, yeah, okay. Right, <clears throat> any other points or questions from the floor? Yeah, uh, Sir David, uh, uh, Lord Hannay, sir. Yeah. Go, do you, wait for a microphone, David, sorry. And then you can pass it on. <laughs> Uh, David Hanney, House Lords. Uh, <clears throat> you've, I think, followed uh, a pattern which is very much the fashion of the moment to decry interventions, uh, some of the interventions of the last 10, 15, 20 years. But you haven't looked at some of the ones where the arguments for intervening earlier were there, like Bosnia or Kosovo or perhaps Cambodia uh, and ones like that and Rwanda. And so I just wondered how you comment on whether this ebb and flow of intervention, is it a, a long-term determination not to get involved in interventions of those sorts, or will it swing back again when something peculiarly horrible mm. either looks like happening or does happen? 
Okay, let's, let's just pass the microphone on so we can take two together here. We might... Briefly, John Everard, I'm a former diplomat. Uh, yeah. You've talked about the revolution in information transmission uh, between the, the generals and the front line. Of course, another kind of information transmission which a problem particularly seems to uh, afflict autocracies is the reluctance of generals and indeed lower level commanders in the field to pass up bad news to senior leaders. How far do you think that is shaping Russian policy in Ukraine? Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, uh, just to tell that, I, a lot. I mean, uh, I think it's a problem. It's another problem with autocracies. Um, the, 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 the hierarchy uh, and the reluctance to pass on bad news uh, inhibits what we would call mission command. It inhibits local initiative, never mind. Uh, you know, there's just this interesting question. You know, Putin is not a man who surfs the internet. He's not on Twitter all the time. Uh, how much does he actually know? Who's telling him? Uh, I mean, there's, you know, there's some indications that it took a while before he cottoned on um, that the, the, the things really weren't going that well. Um, David's question is, you know, I was, you know... I was not against humanitarian interventions. I, did, uh, I wrote about it, um, uh, and you know, um, the, the, the thing that took me one afternoon, uh, sort of the Chicago, uh, my, my, my asked by number ten to write a draft, for, mm. or not even a draft, some ideas for a speech by Tony Ben, Tony, Tony Blair, um, ended up as a doctrine, um, and. The point about the Chicago speech, of, which is, as you know, in the middle of Kosovo, was it tried, it reflected my views, which was that, on the one hand, there were occasions when in, interference in somebody else's internal affairs was justified because of, for humanitarian and, and other reasons. Um, and that had happened all through the, the former Yugoslavia falling apart. And you could add Sierra Leone or see what happened when we didn't act in Rwanda and, and so on. Um, but that couldn't be a carte blanche. So there were five tests, um, which you know, I think uh, 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 remained good tests. Are we sure of our case? Um, uh, have, have diplomatic options been exhausted? Um, is there a military feasible option? Are we prepared for the long term? And is it in our national interest? And I still think they're quite good tests um, the, the, to apply. And you don't get many cases where they all say you can, you can tick all the boxes. And sometimes you're going to have to balance um, one against the other because you know, they're, they're, they're questions to ask rather than all boxes that have to be ticked. Um, so uh, I think the problem was that we went into Iraq um, with a sort of Bosnia mentality, if you like, uh, in some ways, that, that, that we understood this sort of thing without actually understanding the completely different political context in which we were about to engage. Um, so, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't definitely not rule out interventions of that sort in the future. Um, but it will depend on circumstances. You know, who knows what's going to happen in Europe? Um, let's say if Russia does lose, um, the, you, know, you, you could get all sorts of upheavals taking place in and around that air, that, that former Soviet space. Um, you know, so who knows what's going to what's going to happen? So you, you know, never say never. And, and but, just briefly on on information going up to well, I, 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 I answered that. I mean, that, that was the, uh, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and that's the problem. Uh, okay, and very briefly, Sam, since you're there, um, Jean Morgan, uh, do you think the British government has lost credibility internationally because of domestic turmoil? Quick one for you on this. All your, all your comments are pretty acerbic. <laughs> um, in some ways, yes. I think, you know, you look, you look at the papers around the world and the news bulletins around the world, Britain has become a bit of a joke in the last few weeks. I hope that will now die, die away again and things will calm down a bit. But actually, I think in terms of, sort of serious foreign policy and 
Britain's role in, in Ukraine and so on, I don't, I don't think, I think that sort of counterbalanced it quite effectively. And so I don't, at the moment, at least if things now settle down, I think it's been a bit of comedy for the rest of the world, but, but it will now, it, it hasn't really seriously affected our institution. Yeah, like all things, these days will pass. Yes. Yeah. I remember Laurie mentioning the, um, what became the Chicago Doctrine. I remember somebody asking me about it. I said, well, it was so good, it could have been written by an academic. <laughs> <laughs> However, at that point, <coughs> we should draw this uh, to a close. Uh, on your behalf, let me thank uh, Sam Friedman and Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman for speaking about uh, Lawrence Friedman's book on command, which we warmly recommend to you, and some copies are available here for those of you who are uh, in the room. Remember that on the uh, 7th of December, you can be back here and uh, hear uh, Lord Derrick talking about his assessment uh, of the midterm elections in America. But for now, speaking about command, uh, thank you for watching, thank you for being here, and good afternoon from the National Liberal Club and the Global Strategy Forum. Thank you.